Hello and welcome to Antitrust Code, a podcast by Concurrence. Today I am talking to Julian Wright, the Lim Chong Ya Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics at the National University of Singapore. We're going to be talking about platforms and innovation. This series is supported by Facebook. Julian, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before we get started into the real details of innovation, tell me firstly, how would you define a platform? So a platform in its simplest terms is, is just a firm or intermediary that's bringing together different customers, right? And it's enabling interactions or transactions between those customers. Could be financial transactions, it could be communications, um, you know, any kind of interaction that it's enabling, that, that is how we think about a platform. And obviously that covers a lot of different uh, applications, um, both online and also offline. So physical platforms like shopping malls, they enable interactions between retailers and, you know, regular customers who come in the shopping mall. So I guess what you're saying is that sort of the platforms aren't necessarily directly offering the service or the goods themselves. Exactly. So the comparison would be a sort of more linear business model where you have an upstream firm that maybe produces a product themselves and then sells it to consumers or maybe buys a product, repackages it, you know, markets it to consumers like a typical retailer. So that is in contrast to an organization where the business model is instead bringing together different customers and just enabling those customers to interact in some way. And actually, if you think about this definition of a platform, this, there's a whole continuum from you know, really pure platforms where all they do is bring together the different customer groups, right? So you know, a, a good example of a pure platform would be something like eBay, um, or Craigslist in the US, you know, where they really don't do much else other than, you know, create this um, way in which buyers and sellers can meet each other, right? Um, all the way through to a pure retailer, you know, which is just purely buying goods, putting them on their shelves, selling them at the prices they choose, you know, deciding on the marketing and everything else. In between those two extremes, there's a whole continuum. So if you think about something like Uber, Right. Uber is looks like a platform because it's enabling this interaction between the drivers and the riders, right? But it is also sort of controlling some of those uh, some of those interactions. So it's setting the price, for instance. So it's not sort of a pure platform where it lets the users, you know, decide on all the terms. Um, and and another point to notice, you know, firms are not all born platforms. You know, you think about eBay, it started off as a platform. It's a marketplace from, from, the, from the start. Other firms, they shifted from being more like a linear business model to a platform business model. And of course, the best example there would be Amazon, right? Amazon started as a, as a book e-commerce store and of course transformed into a multi, you know, multi-sided platform with a marketplace uh, in particular. And do they go the other way? So do you start off with a platform whose core capability is to bring users together, but then they expand beyond that so that they start offering services themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's not as common, but there are, you know, examples. Um, and it's more the case that, you know, they, they start off where they're just bringing together these different groups. And then they realize actually the users, maybe the customers actually want the platform in this case to get more involved in the transaction and to take care of the customer service and to set the price and to do all these other things. And so they evolve more into a traditional retail model. So an example of that in the US is Zappos, which is a shoe retailer. Uh, it's, you know, it's started off purely as a marketplace and then it transformed itself over time into a, just a typical uh, e-commerce retailer of shoes. Uh, and there's, you know, there's, there's plenty of other, you know, smaller examples. And so what point does this become a competition problem? What are the factors we need to be concerned about in terms of antitrust or competition rules? So, I mean, one of the features of these platforms is that because they are connecting customers, 
they enjoy um, network effects, right? Or they, they create network effects. So the more people who use the, you know, who join the platform, the better it is for everyone. Okay, if you think about Facebook, or if you think about a marketplace like uh, on Amazon or eBay, you know, the more users there are, the more values created for everyone. And of course, network effects, um, that's, that's an efficiency, that's great. That's making everyone better off, but it also can create conditions in which those firms have a lot of market power, right? Because with the network effect, then a new company comes along and wants to compete that doesn't have all those users, it's gonna be at a competitive disadvantage. So network effects by themselves is not a sort of, doesn't create a competition case, right? But it does, it does have the potential to create market power. And once you have a lot of market power, then when you do certain things, like you, you, know, you have exclusive contracts or you do self-preferencing and so on, then there may be more scrutiny and there's more potential for harm, you know, competition harm. So I would say the network effects is the main thing. And secondary to that would be the data. Uh, and the data would, you know, data can create network effects and data can uh, sort of make the network effects stronger. And so that, that's another similar aspect. Data in itself is not a competition problem, but if it creates market power and the firms are doing anti-competitive, you know, they're using anti-competitive instruments or they're doing things that are anti-competitive, then you have an issue. I know, and this is something that the EU is looking at at the moment, considering data as a competition asset, although whether it will come about, we have to wait and see. Um, you mentioned market power. And I'm wondering how important is the definition of the market sector? Uh, because you also mentioned Uber, which says we don't operate as a transport company, we are a tech company. And they get into all sorts of difficulties with regards to other laws, not particularly competition. But with regard to competition, is this an, an area that we should be concerned about in terms of definitions of markets? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I guess one thing to keep in mind is and I said this at the beginning, there's just so many different types of platforms um, and different types of, even within marketplaces, you know, there's, there's thousands of different marketplaces in all different sectors, B2B and business to consumer and so on. And some are for transactions, um, you know, and some are more intermediated, some have more control, some have less. So there's a wide range and it shouldn't be sort of one, um, sort of market approach that applies to all platforms. It's not like platforms are a very homogenous um, type of business model. They actually, you know, cover quite a range of different um, types of business models. As I said, in that continuum from completely hands off, we are allowing the users to have complete control all the way to sort of controlling the terms of the interaction. And therefore, the sort of market study that you might do, it shouldn't be, um, first of all, it shouldn't be the same approach for every market. Secondly, like it's not really such a thing as a platform market, right? I think that's important to emphasize. Platforms are competing in markets, often with traditional business models. So, you know, if Amazon selling some, something, something selling on Amazon, that's competing with you know, something selling by, sold by Walmart, right? Or, you know, other retailers. And therefore it's not really competition um, shouldn't be defined in the market of platforms, but rather in the market of whatever they're selling and the demand for that product and substitutability between the different providers of those products. So that's sort of a second point, you know, first one, heterogeneous types of platforms. Secondly, shouldn't really think of about platform as, a market, right? It's just a player, it's a type of business model in markets. Well, let's talk now about another major business model, which is the data driven advertising model, which is something that maybe a lot of these platforms didn't set out to do, but sort of do on the side because they've got such an accumulation of data. Are consumers aware of how platforms make their money if they're doing this or how their data might be used to make money? And if so, is that something that, that they need to worry about from a competition point of view? 
Yeah, so I mean, I don't know whether, to what extent consumers know, but, you know, anecdotally, it seems like they may not be so aware. We know like some of the cases in the US when they went to, to the uh, government, you know, many people in the government didn't know how these, these platforms are making money. Um, so whether or not consumers know, one thing that I think is important to emphasize is this business model based on data and advertising, it's, it is a sort of two-sided business model, right? Like you are giving some service to consumers, like, you know, a very good way to find stuff like a search engine, right? Or maybe a social media platform like Facebook. And on the other side, you are providing a service to companies, startups, businesses that want to reach these consumers. And now they can do very targeted advertising with because of the data, right? So one thing, you know, when you think about the use of that data, um, yes, from a consumer's point of view, they may be worried about privacy, but the flip side of that coin is by enabling businesses to target, you know, consumers who are particularly, you know, appropriate for their business, you are really promoting the ability for firms to enter markets and to, to grow, right? This is very important for startups because startup businesses, they need to be able to, they can't afford to have a national advertising campaign, billboards, right? Go on national TV. For them, the use of something like, uh, Google ads or Facebook ads is really critical to be able to reach the particular customer, a small group of customers that may be able to start using their product and see whether they find product market fit. So in that sense, you know, there's a flip side to the privacy debate, which is really enabling um, new companies to come into the markets and make it a lot easier for them to enter and, and, and to sell to the right type of customers, right, to reach them. Now, I mean, whether that's on net a good thing or a bad thing, I think it's just important that both sides, you know, both sides of that debate are taken into account and that it'd be good if consumers were aware, like, you know, it's not like their data uh, is sold. Like when I search on Google, it's not like Google is selling my data to some third party that's then going to use it. Rather, Google is using my search behavior to make sure that businesses that want to, you know, reach an audience like me can target their ads and, you know, find the appropriate potential consumers. And so in that sense, if you think about it from, you know, value creation, it is positive as long as consumers are sort of aware of how their data is being used and have the appropriate choices about opting out um, from their data being used in that way. So um, moving on a little bit, how does monopolization work in the big tech sector? For example, search engines preferencing their own companies, products and services. I mean, this is again, I think a little bit about those network effects and using them. Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's what I would call data network effects in the case of search, because when you use search, you think about the traditional meaning of a network effect. It's not like you use search because more other people use search, right? I don't get more benefit from using Google search just because lots of other people are using it, not directly, but indirectly I do because the more other people use it, the better Google gets at finding the right search results using its data algorithms. Um, and therefore data is working a bit like a network effect because the more people who search on Google, the better it is at answering my search queries the better results I get, the more I want to use it, the more, you know, everyone benefits. So in that sense, um, it has a similar effect, right? It gives it market power. It does have a similar effect to network effect, uh, to network effects. And therefore it does mean that if Google starts, you know, it, it's built up the search engine, it's very powerful, has all this data and the algorithms, everyone's using it because it's the best. It does mean if Google then does things, that are, uh, you know, anti-competitive to, you know, deliberately to restrict competition, then those things, given its market power, would have to be considered under competition law. 
right? So the data is only relevant from the perspective of the fact that it creates that market power that enables um, Google to be in a position to potentially do things that are anti-competitive. In and of itself, it doesn't, it's not anti-competitive. Well, one of the phrases we hear a lot um, when thinking about competition, antitrust and so on in the tech world is the so-called digital gatekeepers. Um, what do we mean by that? And what are the concerns regarding that? Is it software primarily or hardware or a mixture of the two? Yeah, so I mean, that's, I think that's a EU definition, um, but it's not a term that economists um, have created or used before. So I think it's, you know, it's deliberately chosen to select certain firms, big tech firms that would, you know, they're concerned about. Um, but the idea, as far as I understand it, is just, you know, that as a gatekeeper, you have control of access to certain customers. So if I'm a business user and I want to reach certain customers, I have to go through this gatekeeper, right? So I think the most obvious example would, in terms of the big tech companies would actually be thinking about Apple um, at the iOS and Google with Android, right? If I'm an app developer and I want to reach people with, you know, to, to sell my app, to use my app, I don't have much choice, right? I have to go through uh, Apple with iOS and Google with Android. And so in that sense, they, they're gatekeepers. And then I think in Europe, they said, well, these digital gatekeepers, they should be for core, certain core platform services. And that actually covers a whole range of different things. And of course, they should affect a lot of people, right? I mean, I could be a gatekeeper for a very niche product, but to be considered uh, of concern, it should be a, you know, a, a business that controls a, a wide, uh, a large amount of commerce. Absolutely. That, that's why I mentioned hardware. Obviously, I knew you were probably <laughs> going to be the example of phones. Um, well, thank you very much, Julian. Final question. What are your predictions for the platform sector? I know you said that isn't really a sector, but for the whole area regarding platforms over the next 20 years or so, what big changes do you think we're going to see or we're going to see any changes in the law? Yeah, so I think from the business point of view, um, obviously uh, we're going to see new platforms emerge that uh, take on the current big players. And we've seen this with, you know, businesses like TikTok, um, Clubhouse is a recent phenomenon, and, you know, but the point about these platform businesses is they can scale exponentially because of the network effects and the very low cost structure in terms of marginal costs. So you can see them rise up very quickly and challenge uh, existing incumbents. And you, you're seeing that in China, right? It's just some new platforms have come up and really, uh, growing super fast and then taking on the giants incumbents like uh, Alibaba and Tencent. So that's one thing I would expect to see more, you know, over time. Um, then the other thing is um, I would actually, because of the sort of regulatory constraints that are going to be put on these platforms, I would expect to see some shift in business model away from a very open types of platforms and more towards the sort of walled garden Apple approach of, you know, keeping everything inside their own ecosystem and not opening up too much. I mean, if Apple had produced all the apps itself, you know, and done everything itself and everything was an Apple product, it wouldn't actually have any competition problem. And that's the attraction of having a closed system. Right? You don't open it up. And once you open it up, then you, you know, if you, you could be accused of steering towards your own products, you can be accused of, you know, various things. So that's the second thing I think there may be, you know, as these businesses transform over time, they may shift a little bit more towards closed systems, which I think is, would be unfortunate because not necessarily as efficient as an open system. And then I think the third thing that may be the most surprising to um, competition authorities or regulators that, you know, probably not thinking much about 
it's actually I think blockchain will be sort of a new revolution that will potentially unseat many of the incumbent platforms. And the reason for thinking this is blockchain has a completely different business model, which basically commits all the users um, from, from the start, they make a commitment that we will never, you know, charge you these fees. We will never um, take your data. We will never do all these things that people are complaining about the platforms doing, right? And so it's a, it's a type of approach that enables uh, a business from the start to commit to behaving in a certain way and the community of users taking control over the way in which it works. And that's a very you know, fundamentally different way of running a business, right? And, you know, once they solve all the difficult problems of, you know, how to get the coordination between the different parties working, that potentially can sort of uh, revolutionize, I think, some of these different markets because it's a completely decentralized approach in which, you know, there's no potentially commu community run with, you know, low or zero fees and so on. So that's something, you know, in the longer run that could make all of this regulatory and competition concern about platforms completely redundant. Absolutely. It's uh, also big for transparency as well as for, for user involvement. Exactly. Thank you very much, Julian, for talking to us today. I think we've covered a lot of ground um, and I thank you also. Our listeners do join me again soon for another Antitrust Code podcast where we'll be talking about tech and competition.